So a lot of this course will be about high dimensions. I want to give you some intuition of things that happen in high dimensions. We're going to be studying high dimensional data in particular. And in order to give you some intuition of what happens in high dimensions, first I want to sort of break your low dimensional intuition. So, so let's do that by just taking, taking a few steps. And, and let's think of D, D, uh, let's think of D as large, right? It is a dimension. Okay, so let's take, let's take two sets. Let's take the ball, right? The radius of the car. So this is what? This is the set of points in our D, such that the L to the R of X you know, is equal to R, right? Okay. Let's take the cube. Okay, so I take the cubes, D, or you know, in higher dimensions we call it a hypercube. Let's take it, oh, let's write it instead in uh, you know, just as the Cartesian product of R, it's also of, of radius, of radius R, uh, of course R, radius R times D times. Okay, and now let's look at let's look at the volumes of these uh, of these objects. Okay, so you can work out the integrals. I'm not going to do it here, but if you take the volume of the ball in the dimensions of radius r, right, this is not so hard to get an exact formula. Okay, so it's pi d over two. You get an r to the d. And then you get a quotient that it's d over two times gamma of d over two. Okay, and now you know this is gamma, which is like a, 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 fact, uh, a factorial. So we can see right here, right? We can see roughly what are, what is the scaling of this, right? And asymptotically, this is the same as for d pi. And it's not just scaling, it's that the fraction tends to 1, 2 pi e over d, d over Okay, times r to the d, of course, right? Okay, so in particular, we get already here a few interesting things. If we take the sphere of radius 1, then the volume, right, the volume of the sphere of radius 1 is going to 0 very, very quickly as d goes to infinity. Right, because r is 1, as 1 over root d is not even so important, but you get a 1 over, right, you get a 1 over d to the d halves. Right? And so this goes, you know, will go to 0 extremely quickly. And in fact, in order for the sort of the volume to stay constant, you would need the r, right, to the r to the d to fight this term, right? Let's even forget about this one. So you would need r to be, right, you would get r squared in here, because there's a d, right? So r squared to d over 2. So you would need r to be something like root d. So in order for the volume to stay constant, the ball would need to grow quite a bit. Okay, so, so let's see what else we can, we can say about these objects. And then we'll try to draw a picture. Of course, the volume of the cube is also very easy, to, is, is even easier to compute. Right? I mean, here we didn't really compute it, but it's an integral you can see in the, in the lecture notes. Okay, so let's take the volume. Okay, so this is, of course, you know, volumes of cubes are very easy to compute. This is just too hard to do. Okay, so in particular, the volume of the cube of length 1, eh? right, so the volume of CD half, is always 1. Okay, so, so now let's draw a picture. Let's take D equals 2. Okay. For dimension 2, let's draw the sphere or the ball of radius 1, right? And now let's draw the cube of radius a half. Now 
right? This is a radius one half. Okay, this one is a radius one. Okay, it fits completely inside. In particular, you know, the point that's furthest away from zero, right? It's not so hard that the value of this Pythagoras. You see that the value of this is square root two over two. Right? So it's still smaller than one. Okay. Okay, so what happens for three? Okay, d equals three is, is a little, uh, you know, it's a little harder to draw, but we can still do it, I think. So d equals three, or we can try at least, right? Okay, so we have a cube and we have a sphere. And the cube is still inside the sphere, right? It's not so easy to see that most distance point will now be scored with 3 over 2, right, which is still smaller than 1, and so it's still inside. Okay, but what's the point between, you know, the furthest away point from the cube and the center of the cube, right? The, the diameter of the cube will be, will be, the cube is of length 1, so by Pythagoras, the diameter of the cube is root d, right? So the value of the diameter of the cube, right? diameter of the cube will be in general root d. And so as soon as d is 4, then the cube will start touching the sphere. Right? So for d equals 4, sort of the right picture to have in mind, I mean, you can take a projection, you can make this picture precise, but sort of the picture to have in mind is maybe something like this. And this is a projection of the, of the cube in four dimensions. Right? This, this is very strange. It looks not like a convex set, even though the cube is a convex set. Right, and in particular, you know, the distance between these two points should be root d, right? The distance between the center and the point outside is root d over 2, right? And the distance of the sphere is 1. Okay, and in particular, we know that as d grows, now let's take d very, very large. Right? If we take d very large, then what's the picture? Right? Somehow the cube will, will have, you know, some points in the cube will be at distance a half from the center, but some points will be at distance square root d over 2. Right, so somehow the right picture to have in mind of the cube is that it does something like this. It has this sort of tentacles coming out. Right, well, the sphere of radius 1 sits somewhere here. And this, you know, it's quite surprising when you see it the first time, but it's actually a very important thing to have in mind. That convex sets, the cube is fully convex, right? Any two points in the cube, if I connect a line, it's still in the cube. But sort of convex sets, you know, the sphere, not the sphere will always be round, it's the sphere. But other convex sets will sometimes have this tendency, that they'll look like extremely spiky things where most of its volume, right? The volume of the sphere goes to zero very, very quickly, like exponentially quickly, as, uh, as the, you know, as, as d goes to infinity, while the volume of the cube stays constant. So most of the volume actually lies on these, on these corners, right? And so, if you look at these, these, these projections, this, this, you know, this picture you should have in mind, it looks completely non-convex, right? But this is a convex set that has these strange properties, right? Convex sets in high dimensions, they actually look quite spiky and quite pointy. And this is, I think, the first time you see it extremely counterintuitive. And, and it's useful to have, uh, you know, to, to, to have this uh, sort of break your low-dimensional intuition and have this intuition of what happens in high dimensions. And so high dimensions has, you know, let me show you another strange thing that happens in high dimensions. Okay, so let's see, let's see a second, uh, second strange thing that sort of in high dimensions. And, you know, in the lecture notes, you can see a few others. But let's take, let's take a sphere and let's peel the, the boundary of it. Okay, so let's take a sphere, a ball, in the dimensions of radius 1, and let's remove from it, let's remove from it the boundary, right? Let's remove from it a thin layer, a thin layer 
at the boundary. Right? Think like you have some piece of fruit and you're peeling the fruit and you want to see what happens. Okay, so one way to, to think about what is, what is uh, the, the, the sphere after you've, uh, right, after you've um, removed the layer on the outside, well, is just now what you're left with is the sphere at the radius slightly smaller. Right? Okay. So let's say what, what is the, the ratio of the volume that's left? Okay, so what is the ratio? What is the ratio of the volume that's left? Okay, so let's take volume of you know, the ball what's left over the volume of the original set. Okay, so this is some formula that doesn't depend on the radius, only the r to the d depends on the radius. Right, so what is this? This is 1 minus epsilon to the d. So this means that for any epsilon smaller than, bigger than 0, as d goes to infinity, the ratio goes to 0 exponentially, extremely quickly. So what this means for any epsilon smaller than 0 as the dimension goes, most of the volume, extremely little volume is inside, most of the volume is in the boundary. And in a way, this kind of like predictability of, of high dimensions, in the sense that if I was to draw a random variable in the ball, I just showed to you that with very, very high probability, say uniformly on the ball, with very, very high probability, it would be at the boundary. So this is sort of some kind of predictability of, of random variables in high dimensions in, in a certain sense. It's what we sometimes call blessings in high dimensions. Right? There's, of course, a curse of high dimensions, which is more, more often... Uh, mentioned, which is the fact that, right, if I want to, to have a grid in high dimensions that completely, you know, covers my space, discretizes my space, of course, if I want to put a grid discretize a space of d dimensions, I'm going to have to pay exponential in d, right, because, well, okay, there's two ways of seeing this. One is you can just start writing a grid in one dimension, and then when you're doing two, you see the square, and then you're doing three, you see the cube. Or you can say that, you know, a grid is points that need to be near each other, so you're sort of covering with balls, but you really have to cover a cube, right? And because the volume of the ball goes to zero and the cube stays at one, there's also another way of seeing this issue. But there's this sort of predictability of, of random variables in high dimensions. I mean, here, if I think of random variables in uniform random variable, this is going to be key to a lot of the course. And now you see, once we have this, we can ask ourselves other questions, right? Because we can ask ourselves, Okay, just this means the typical point, if I draw a random point from the ball of radius 1, how close is it going to be to the boundary? Right? We know that for any epsilon, it's going to be at least epsilon close because the probability of not goes to zero very quickly. But I could try to you know, write epsilon in, as a function of d in a way that this becomes you know, a number that doesn't grow with d. And once I do this, you know, I can of course write epsilon equals t over d. Right? And then if I do this, what do I get? Right, I get 1 minus t over d to the d goes to infinity to e to the minus t. So we can even from this argument deduce that not only, you know, most points are in the, in the boundary, but actually they are a distance 1 over d from the boundary, or constant over d from the boundary. Right, and this is the kind of, of statement, I mean, for now I haven't used any probability, we just, you know, started with some simple thing about, about uh, the volumes and objects in high dimensions, but you're already seeing two things. Convex sets in high dimensions look strange, right? This is an important intuition to have. And even though there's this sort of curse of high dimensions that they get bigger and bigger in a way and harder and harder to, to have, you know, discretizations and so on, you do have this phenomenon that sometimes things become more predictable rather than less predictable, right? When I draw a point randomly on the sphere in one dimension, two dimensions, it could be anywhere. When I draw in very high dimensions, I know for a fact I'm in the bound. Okay, and so now, you know, in what follows, we're going to introduce probability theory, just a very basics, because we'll be the right language to exploit all of this, and so that we can talk about high-dimensional data and algorithms and so on. Okay, thank you.